Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Friday, April 1st, which is pretty incredible. And it's about 18 minutes after 10. And we are working on S-140, an act relating to prohibiting civil arrests at courthouses. We did have a walkthrough of the bill yesterday, so we, will, we will, won't be starting with that. We'll be starting with our, our witness testimony. And I'd like to please start with the ACLU. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, for the record, my name is Indy Schoenherr. I'm the Advocacy Fellow at the ACLU of Vermont, um, and I'm just grateful to be here to testify on this um, important piece of legislation. Um, the ACLU of Vermont supports S-140 because it creates a more accessible legal system for all residents of Vermont. As an organization that works to protect people's civil liberties, we recognize the importance of making sure that our courts are open to everyone. Uh, for that reason, we strongly support this bill's proposal to prohibit civil arrests of any person or family or household member who's attending a court proceeding. Uh, under the Trump administration, both ICE and Customs and Border Protection dramatically expanded their presence at criminal and civil courts, including in family, landlord tenant, and traffic courts across the United States. In New York, Immigrant Defense Project survey found that the number of courthouse arrests increased by 1,200% in 2017. Uh, in 2018, the ACLU and the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project conducted a survey of law, law enforcement officers, judges, prosecutors, and others in the first year um, Trump was in office. What is clear from these results is the presence of these officers and increased immigration arrests have created deep insecurity and fear among immigrant communities, stopping many from coming to court or even calling police in the first place. The impact of immigration enforcement at courthouses greatly undermines the security of vulnerable communities and the fundamental right to equal protection under the law shared by non-citizens and citizens. Uh, the fear of courthouse arrests means immigrants are less likely to cooperate with law enforcement investigation, uh, report crimes, and participate in court proceedings. This can have a negative impact on public safety. Uh, prosecutors across the U.S. reported that crimes including domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking were harder to investigate and prosecute because immigrant crime survivors feared consequences if they came forward. Courts cannot operate fairly and effectively when people do not feel safe appearing in person. Um, and just to highlight some of the key findings um, in this report, uh, approximately 20% of law enforcement officers surveyed found that immigrant crime survivors were less likely to help investigators when police arrived at the scene of a crime or to help in post-crime scene investigations or to work with prosecutors compared to the previous year. 82% uh, of prosecutors said that compared to the previous year, domestic violence cases were underrepresented and harder to prosecute. 70% reported the same for sexual assault, 55% uh, found the same difficulties for human trafficking, and 48% for child abuse. Um, and along with that, advocates and legal service provided, providers reported uh, a 40% decrease in the number of cases filed on behalf of immigrant crime survivors. Um, but coming back to this bill specifically, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, some of the discussion focused on the question of who this bill should encompass, specifically whether to extend its protections beyond people directly in the court proceedings uh, to include family members accompanying them. There are several legitimate reasons why it's necessary for a family member to accompany an individual to the court. As highlighted in previous testimony, Sometimes family members are requested by the court. They may be needed to provide transportation or to provide support for victims of crimes. And for these reasons, the ACLU supports extending the same protections to all people in Vermont courthouses, none of whom should fear detention by ICE or be deterred from accessing the legal system as a result. Uh, Vermont has made great progress in making the state a safer, more welcoming place for its residents. Everyone who calls the state home deserves access to justice, and we support this bill 
because it is one more way to help build trust with immigrant communities and better support the safety of communities across the state. Uh, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for mentioning um, the need to um, extend it to someone who is accompanying um, a, a party, because that did come up, um, I, I believe, um, Coach asked about it yesterday, and I had I had a note to ask you um, if you can say something. But I was just about to look at the language. I don't know if, if you have um, suggested language or can think about it, or um, maybe it's any person. Um, I don't have any suggested language at this time, yeah, so I, I think about it and um, come back um, with with some suggestions. Yeah, that, that's fine, and, and we'll work with um, uh, legislative council as as well. But. Um, Thank you. Any questions? Anybody? Nope. Um, okay. Not seeing any. Um, okay. Hello. Will, hello. Welcome back. Migrant Justice, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, committee. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good to see you all. Uh, my name is Will Lambeck. Uh, I'm a staff member with Migrant Justice. Uh, I'll have a couple of remarks, and then you'll be hearing next um, from uh, my good justice member, uh, Beto, uh, not Beto O'Rourke, um, but uh, Beto Sanchez. Um, so uh, uh, my good justice, as many of you know, uh, is a Vermont-based human rights organization founded and led by immigrant farm workers. Um, and we uh, uh, became aware of a law that was passed in New York State in 2020 called the Protect Our Courts Act. Um, when that passed, we uh, brought that law to the attention of several elected officials in Vermont, uh, and uh, that resulted in, in the following year, uh, Senator Bruth adopting, adapting that bill and introducing it into uh, the Senate uh, late in the session. And then uh, this year, uh, it, it began receiving hearings, and, and that brings us to where we are today. Um, we, uh, we saw the importance of bringing these protections to Vermont because, unfortunately, uh, immigration arrests in courthouses uh, are uh, reality in, in this state. Um, uh, migrant justice staff members have been uh, direct witnesses to, to uh, multiple immigrant farm workers detained by ICE at Vermont courthouses. And you'll be hearing uh, one of those testimonies today. Uh, I, I personally have received calls from folks as they're being detained during uh, and after court appearances this happens at uh, multiple courthouses around the state. It's not um, specific to one particular courthouse or one particular region. And in all of these cases, uh, these are civil detentions by ICE, uh, not criminal cases, uh, never executed with judicial warrants. Uh, these are detentions solely for the purpose of deportation under federal civil immigration laws. Uh, these uh, civil arrests affect both, uh, well, they affect criminal defendants, uh, litigants in family and civil cases, uh, people who are seeking protective orders, uh, and, and all court users. Uh, there was a question in the walkthrough about who this would apply to, um, and, and I'll, I'll confess to not being able to fully follow the thread uh, on the, the YouTube about where that question landed our understanding from the way that the bill was drafted and the discussion in Senate Judiciary is that uh, these protections would apply to household members of all court users, regardless of whether or not that household member is a party to the case. Um, and and I'll, uh, I, I'd like to better understand the, the read of the committee and, and um, if, if there is an amendment that needs to be made to clarify that, uh, uh, we should do so. But um, under 3701 subsection uh, A, um, any person or family or household member of the person, um, we, we think that language uh, should be sufficiently inclusive. Um, and, and this, of course, is, is important. Um, I, I know uh, Representative Christie uh, shared a, an experience that, that he was aware of. Um, I, I've also had uh, personal experiences with this. So just to give an example, uh, in the Addison County Courthouse, there was a, a, an immigrant farm worker who was being detained on a criminal charge. He had a bond hearing. Uh, his attorney uh, asked the defendant's brother to be present to show community ties um, during that bond hearing, something that 
uh, as you all know, can, can be very important for, um, for being granted bond. Uh, I accompanied the brother of the defendant, and, and as I walked into the courtroom, I saw um, uh, ICE's uh, Vermont Director of Operations sitting uh, in that courtroom, um, and, and that resulted in the uh, brother of the defendant not being present, um, uh, as was requested by the attorney, um, and, and negatively affecting the case. So, so certainly we do want to see this applied to family members and household members, uh, regardless of whether or not they're a, a formal party to a case. Um, uh, this bill not only protects uh, uh, immigrant rights um, from, uh, from arrest, uh, detention, deportation, and family separation, uh, but it also strengthens due process and the integrity of the judicial system. Uh, when it went through the Senate, uh, it had broad support. It passed out a Senate Judiciary uh, uh, on a unanimous vote and then passed on a voice vote on the floor. The Senate heard uh, testimony uh, uh, that was very supportive from many government agencies, including the Office of Racial Equity, the Human Rights Commission, the Office of the Defender General, and the Attorney General's Office. Uh, also supported testimony from community partners like the ACLU and others. Um, there were slight amendments that took into account comments from the Sheriff's Association and the Department of Corrections, um, and it ended up passing uh, overwhelmingly. So we hope that uh, uh, we'll see speedy passage from the House as well, and that this bill will, will turn into law in Vermont, and that these much-needed protections uh, will, will be extended. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Beto now, and then at the conclusion of his testimony, if, if folks have questions for either myself or for him. Uh, and I'll be interpreting uh, both those remarks. Hola, Beto, ¿qué tal? Thank you. Estás en silencio. ¿Puedes quitar el mute? Ahora sí. Entonces, Beto, pues estás aquí con el comité eh, de la Cámara de Representantes y cuando te sientes listo, eh, puedes hablar. Ok. Eh, hola, mi nombre es Cruz Alberto Sánchez Pérez. Hi, my name is Cruz Alberto Sánchez Pérez. Eh, fui arrestado en el 31 de diciembre del 2018 en una corte. And I was uh, arrested on December 31st, 2018 at a Vermont courthouse. Mm. Cometí el error, lo cual estoy arrepentido de manejar bajo las influencias del alcohol. Uh, and I had uh, made a mistake, uh, one for uh, which I, I am very sorry uh, that I had uh, been driving under the influence of alcohol. Y tuve una corte a la cual me presenté y para hacer las cosas bien y estar en todo lo correcto y ahí. Uh, Asumir mi responsabilidad como conductor y fue donde me arrestó el ICE. Um, and so uh, I was given a, a court date and, and I uh, uh, showed up to court because I, I wanted to do what was right and, and take responsibility for my actions. Uh, but when I did so, I was arrested by ICE. Eh, lo cual pensé que iba, iba a tener un buen trato, pero... Al parecer todos en la corte sabían que eso iba a pasar porque cuando yo llegué eh, había un papel en grande que decía corte. Uh, Beto, ¿puedes repetir la última parte? Se cortó el señal un poquito. ¿Puedes repetir la última parte, Beto? Se cortó el señal. Ok. Ok. Um... Cuando yo llegué a la, a la corte, eh, al parecer todos sabían, menos yo, que yo iba a ser arrestado porque en la puerta había un papel en grande con letras corte privada. Uh, and so when I arrived for my uh, court appearance, uh, everybody in that room, except for me, uh, knew that I was going to be arrested by immigration. And there was a, uh, a sign on the door uh, that said, private courtroom. Eh, la corte duró unos minutos. La verdad, todo estuvo bien. Fue buen trato. Pagué lo, eh, los tickets y solo me dijo el abogado de oficio que me estaba esperando en la puerta de migración. 
Uh, and the court hearing was simple. I, I uh, w was treated well. It was a couple uh, minutes. Uh, I, I was given a, a fine that I had to pay. Uh, but then when I was leaving, my lawyer, my public defender told me that immigration was waiting for me outside the courtroom. Y, y fui arrestado. Entonces, eh, tengo, muy, tengo uh, como tengo muchas preguntas, muchas personas me preguntaban, y si no te presentas a corte, ¿qué pasará? Y, pues, ahí sí creo, al no presentarme estoy en todo lo correcto que me arreste, pero fui a hacer las cosas bien. Entonces, hay muchas personas de aquí de la comunidad que por eso no van, no van a la corte. Um, and so uh, after my experience, a lot of people have asked me, uh, well, if I have a court appearance, should I go or, or should I not go? Um, and this, uh, th this sort of turns things around because you would think that if somebody is given a court date and they don't go to that court date, well, okay, then, uh, then the authorities would be within their right to arrest you. Uh, but if you do have a court date and, and you appear, uh, you're trying to do the, the right thing. And so it's hard to know what, what to tell people. You want to tell them to do the right thing, uh, but, but you can't. Y uh, es como ahora mismo lo que está pasando en la comunidad. Hay personas que, de la comunidad que tienen corte ya pronto. Entonces ellos saben que fui arrestado. Entonces... Muchos ya, ya, ya no quieren ir, no se quieren presentar. Y es por eso, si la ley está aprobada, creo que todo el mundo a, tenemos que hacer las cosas bien. Um, and um, with what's happening in the community right now, I, I know folks who have upcoming court dates and, and they know uh, what happened to me, that I was arrested. And so a lot of people don't, don't want to go to their court dates if they have them. Uh, but if this law is approved, then uh, people can do that. Cuando yo fui arrestado, yo tardé en la cárcel tres meses. When I was uh, detained by immigration, I was held for three months. Y des, yo, yo salí de la cárcel después porque yo tenía eh, un proceso de asilo político, el cual gané. Uh, and I only got out of immigration detention uh, because I was in uh, application or proceedings for political asylum, uh, and that uh, resulted in, in me getting out, and, and I, I eventually uh, was granted asylum. Eh, es por eso que estoy aquí, estoy en esta llamada, porque eh, tuve la suerte de ganar mi asilo político, y es por eso que estoy aquí. Um, and that's the only reason why I'm, I'm here today and, and able to speak with you, uh, because I, I had the good fortune to uh, win my asylum case. Oh, sé que manejar eh, eh, bajo la influencia del alcohol es, es terrible. Para, para conte como se vea, es terrible. Pero lo cual estoy muy arrepentido y sé que no, no lo volveré a hacer. Pero todos queremos hacer las cosas bien y todos cometemos errores. Uh, and, and I know I'm conscious that uh, driving under the influence is, is terrible, and I'm very regretful of that mistake, and it's something that I, uh, I won't do again. Uh, but I also know that, that we're human beings, and, and just like anybody else, people can make mistakes. Gracias, Beto. ¿Algo más? No, creo que estoy bien. Okay, and I think that's all. Thank you. Gracias, Beto. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, <coughs> Alberto. It's, it's, it's so valuable to, to have you here. And I'm so glad that, that you won your asylum case, but I'm so sorry um, the journey that you had to, to go through. And uh, it's, it's so helpful to have, have you here and have a, have a personal experience. You know, it really does bring so much meaning to, to our work. So really very Muchas gracias, Beto. Estoy muy contenta que usted ganó su caso de asilo, eh, pero lo siento mucho por eh, lo que tenía que pasar eh, por todas esas ex experiencias. Y agradezco mucho que usted haya traído su experiencia propia eh, 
eh, a compartir con nosotros porque eso eh, da valor al trabajo que estamos haciendo eh, y, y hace valer eh, lo que queremos hacer. Oh, ok, y bueno, quería agregar algo, algo más. Eh, entonces, cuando, cuando, yo, cuando yo fui arrestado por lo de manejar pagos a influencias de alcohol, Sí, en la corte estuvo bien, me suspendieron mi licencia por seis meses, pagué ticket, y yo creo que es todo lo correcto, no, lo que no veo correcto es por qué tiene que llegar el ICE si no cometimos un, eh, como algo criminal, no estamos pasando un muro, estamos aquí trabajando. Um, and I, I would like to add one more thing, is uh, just to say that when, when I, uh, I was, was arrested uh, for the, the DUI. I had a suspended license. Uh, I paid a fine and, and that's fine. Uh, I, I have no problem with that. But my question is, uh, why would ICE then have to come? Um, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, working honorably um, and, and I don't think they should be involved. Gracias. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Um, Selena, you had a question earlier? Uh, what well, I was just going to, I do actually have a question for Will and Beto, and then I was just going to um, share some of what we heard from legislative council yesterday about this question of who's covered. But maybe I could ask my question first, and then if that's OK. Um, so thank you so much for being here, both of you. And I really appreciate, Beto, the, your um, observation of, you know, you made a mistake and you wanted to take accountability because that's sort of how our court system is supposed to work at its best, is to offer people the chance to be accountable for their actions. and do any restorative um, work that's necessary for themselves or others. I can stop there if you want to translate well and then ask my question. Uh, you, you're good to keep going if you want to finish up. Okay. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, it seems like one of, in your, in this case, I think you were able to um, pay the fine, have the consequences, But I can see how, in addition to just all the trauma and hardship that these ICE detentions cause, they also have the potential to really disrupt that people's um, desire to take accountability and kind of see their case through and take whatever actions might be needed. And I'm just wondering if either of you would like to comment on that. Entonces, eh, Beto, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Aprecio mucho su observación que sí cometió un error, quiso tomar responsabilidad y eh, en su mejor forma así debe de funcionar nuestro sistema judicial. Es ofrecer eh, la chance a la persona a tomar responsabilidad por sus acciones y hacer el trabajo necesario para restaurar, eh, eh, tomar pasos restaurativos uh, para ellos mismos o para otros. Y en este caso, parece que usted pudo pagar eh, la multa, eh, tuvo algunas consecuencias, eh, pero eh, quiero preguntar o, o entender como en casos cuando inmigración arresta a personas, eh, cuando van a sus cortes, en adición a la trauma y las dificultades que esas detenciones causan, eh, ¿Ve que podría tener un potencial de eh, interrumpir eh, ese deseo de una persona de tomar responsabilidad por sus acciones? O en otras palabras, piense que haría menos probable que alguien quiere presentar a la corte o quiere dar seguimiento con un caso? Pues en primero, no, no creo que, pues, de que vuelva a ocurrir, dice. Eh, no, como sabiendo de tu experiencia piense que otros viendo esto le hace menos probable que van a querer tomar responsabilidad de la misma manera que eh, usted tomó responsabilidad? Claro, pero si no existiera que no, que ellos sepan que no va a ir inmigración. 
todo mundo quisiera hacer las cosas bien. De hecho, creo que ya tengo un, un buen récord a, a medida de esto. De muchas personas se comunican conmigo preguntándome cuál es el proceso, qué procede, qué, qué pasa, si voy o no voy. Y no, aún no tengo una respuesta. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, it, it can disrupt that. Um, and if, if people know that immigration <coughs> won't come to detain them, uh, they'll, they'll go because everybody wants to do the, the right thing in these cases. Uh, and the truth is, lots of people uh, have asked me, um, uh, what, what should I do? Should I go to my, my court appearance or not? And, and unfortunately, I, uh, I don't know what, what response to give them right now, knowing the, the risk that they could face. Thank you. Um, what I was going to convey, well, and the, and the chair may, could, could um, weigh in too, but we heard, I think the language as drafted, um, the definition of, you know, a household member, like the, where is covered, but it, the person, it says, so it's a person, family, or household member of, <coughs> the person who is attending a court proceeding in good faith as a party juror, attorney, or witness. Our legislative counsel told us, oh, Eric, maybe you can clarify. Because mm -hmm. I think we heard yesterday that um, the this protection would only apply to folks who had that standing in the court case as a party juror, attorney, or witness. And maybe that was because that tracked most closely to the common law principles that, that this is sort of rooted in. But I think I would like to, as like many have said, like to see it, it kind of extend and have clear protections for people who might be a comp just accompanying someone on their court case and wanting to be there as a support person. But Eric, did I get that right or wrong? Um, yes, you got it right from uh, with the discussion that, that we had yesterday. I think, though, that I have since had a chance to go back and look at the, what happened in the Senate, and, um, and it kind of goes to the language, which might need a bit of tweaking, because I think, as Mr. Lambeck said, the Senate did actually intend to cover uh, family members uh, whether or not the family member actually was a witness or had that specified role. That was the intent. Um, but the fact, for example, that I forgot that and misread the language is probably a, a good reason to clarify. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, uh, and I think it might be easily clarified if you just said something like, you know, uh, um, any person who is attending the court proceeding, good faith, party attorney, et cetera, or any family or household member of that person. And I think that that gets at the same intent, which as I say, the Senate did intend to cover those folks, um, whether or not they fit in one of those defined roles, uh, just that family members would be protected as well. But I think so either that way, or, or maybe just by adding a couple of commas, I think there's a technical way that the language could be clarified, and it might not be a bad idea to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Will, do you want to um, translate so Alberto, because I think it's important, and then we'll yeah. and approach. Thank you. Entonces, eh, Beto, eh, había un intercambio acerca del lenguaje dentro del proyecto de ley. Um, eh, cuando estuvo en el Senado, eh, el intento fue crear una protección que incluye no solamente a personas que son eh, eh, acusados o jurados o testigos en un caso, sino sus familiares también. Eh, eh, la manera que el, el proyecto de ley está escrito eh, creó una duda de si esos familiares estarían incluidos o no. Eh, pero todos en el comité están diciendo que eh, eh, por lo, a, al menos debe de aclarar el lenguaje para asegurar que ese intento sea claro en la ley de que protege uh, a personas en la corte y también sus familiares que pueden estar ahí de apoyo o de raite o lo que sea. Eh, en, 
eh, entendí como que el apoyo es para que, por ejemplo, si voy a la corte con mi familia o amigos, que ellos no sean arrestados. Exacto. And Beto just clarifies, so to, to understand that uh, if, if I go to court with my uh, family or, or roommates, that they, they wouldn't be uh, arrested either. And I said, that that's the intent. Thank you. Uh, coach. Buenos dias. Uh, that was the intent of my question uh, from yesterday, uh, because that's what happened uh, to one of our uh, brothers uh, in White River. Uh, and uh, extended families are, are normal, uh, you know, in our culture. And, you know, I, I can remember, and, and I I'll just kind of qualify this statement. There were times that in our household, we'd have anywhere from 13 to 14 people. You know, there were eight kids in our families. You know, we'd have cousins, aunts and uncles, you know. And so that extended family and friends and roommates piece becomes very critical because maybe one of them is the only one that has transportation. And that's the only way that the uh, claimant can get to that court hearing. And, and that, would, that would be sad if, you know, the community and the family extended or otherwise is trying to do the right thing and in the middle of trying to do the right thing, this occurs. So uh, I really uh, thank Eric for uh, doing his legal magic with the language. And uh, hopefully we'll all be able to come to agreement uh, with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eh, y dice el representante Christie que eh, sí, él el, el quiere que eh, el lenguaje se aclare para asegurar que extiende a, a todos familiares, eh, entendiendo que eh, en nuestras comunidades, eh, cuando hablamos de familia, es una familia que puede ser extensa. Uno puede estar viviendo con sus tíos, sus primos, eh, eh, y en su propio caso, eh, una vez vivía con una familia de entre 13 y 15 personas. Entonces, no solamente es eh, la familia nuclear. Eh, entonces, eh, con esos casos es importante que el, 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 la protección sea lo más extenso posible porque la persona puede depender a alguien por un right eh, a la corte eh, que podría ser un amigo eh, o un compañero de, de casa y esa persona debe de proveer el transporte sabiendo que van protegidos también. Eh, eh, es lo más importante porque cuando uno ya va, ya tiene suspendida su licencia, entonces tienes que buscar a un right de quien te lleve. Yeah, that, that is very important, uh, the transportation piece, because if you're going to court for an issue where your license has been suspended, then obviously you need to ask somebody for a ride, uh, and that person should be protected as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, eso fue todo. Gracias, Beto. Okay, gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, okay. Bye-bye. Uh, Senator General's office. Answer. Thank you. Oh, it's good to be back. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, committee. Um, for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's office. As, as others have already summarized, uh, the sort of broad base support for this bill um, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, I wanted to confirm here this morning that the Office of the Defender General does indeed support this bill. Uh, it is uh, not only non-controversial, because as has already been um, provided, it is long established law in this, this state, and in fact, uh, the federal system and most, most states in the United States, and when I say long established, uh, I think it dates back to the 15th century. Uh, so centuries old common law 
back in England. And then when, of course, English common law uh, jumped the pond and came here, uh, we, we uh, integrated that into our court systems. And again, this is about the common law privilege to not be arrested for um, uh, while you are, are going to court in state courts. And it was deemed an absolute necessity uh, to ensure that actual public justice, justice could be done, the administration of the courts could happen. And so uh, I know that there was discussion yesterday about um, sort of where and how to think about this privilege, uh, whether or not uh, these, this comes, you know, so the, the authority, the, the courts have an inherent authority to ensure that administration of the courts uh, goes forward. It has been compared to a standing order, a standing order prohibiting uh, people from arresting those who are there at the courthouse um, so that they can, can come freely and, and do their business, so that others would not be chilled from coming, uh, from using the court system. And so we heard Mr. Sanchez uh, share his own personal experiences, uh, and he shared that from the perspective of someone who was charged with a crime as a criminal defendant. It could have easily have been someone who was a victim of a crime, who was seeking a protective order, it could have been easily a witness uh, for the prosecution or for the defense on a key case who wouldn't show up to court because of this chilling effect. Uh, and the, the bill extends to prohibiting such civil arrest, not just at the courthouse, but for those who are traveling to and returning from. Now, I just also want to highlight that that was part of old common law privilege. Again, this idea that it's not just about protecting people at the courthouse, but it's arriving and leaving. Um, in Vermont, uh, from my perspective from the Defender General's office, we heard an actual experience uh, of having been arrested by ICE in a Vermont courthouse. Uh, it sounds like it was Windsor Courthouse. Um, I have heard a handful of, of accounts from defense attorneys after the fact, or, or people like Will or those from BOS, um, where people are trying to get to the courthouse because they have a citation date. Uh, Windsor, I've heard from Orange County Courthouse's Chittenden. Um, some are trying to arrive, unlike Mr. Sanchez, where he was able to go through and finish with his criminal proceeding. Uh, I have heard <clears throat> that ICE has apprehended someone who has not yet gotten into the courthouse, has not yet been arraigned, has not yet been assigned a public uh, defender or assigned counsel, assuming that that person was deemed needy and therefore was whisked off into that, that system. Um, and again, no opportunity to have had any legal support. Again, an incredible chilling effect that goes way beyond that individual, right? The communities that hear that um, and what messages that <clears throat> uh, Another anecdotal. Uh, yes. Part. So when that happens, are they found in contempt in addition to being arrested? Yes. The arrest warrant issues because there's no there's right. no presence. Okay. And so that 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 proceeding stays open until um, and of course no one can, can close or reconcile the, the, the charges there. So again, depending on what was the case at issue, uh, there is no closure, right? Uh, and um, the consequences of that um, are numerous. There was another story again in Chittenden where a defense attorney shared that he was expecting his client to show up at a particular hearing in the middle of, of, of the criminal proceeding post arraignment um, and his client never showed up. And what he subsequently learned was that a block or two away from the courthouse, uh, I had apprehended him and arrested him. And so on and on and on. This is for sure not as big of a problem as what we saw going on and heard about in New York and other populous metropolitan um, areas. Uh, that is not to say, though, that it's not a problem, as you've heard, as we see. Um, and so this law is important. Uh, and so we support. As, as to the question of, of how this language could be interpreted as being both not expansive enough, not covering beyond the household family members, however that's defined. Uh, Representative Christie, I think his point of you know, recognizing how, how expansive family members could be, that the second, third, fourth cousins removed, I'm not sure this bill and its current language would cover that. Certainly the cross-reference to household members to the statutory definition is useful, 
as from a lawyer's perspective, but it requires that you have actually lived with someone, right, or have had uh, a, a dating or, or um, you know, spousal family relation that way directly. Uh, so there is that concern. And then, of course, there is uh, the concern that came up during the walkthrough, where there is also, could it be read to also limit um, protection to people who have an actual status in the case itself, a witness, juror, and I and I agree with uh, with legislative counsel that it, you know, I'm hearing it discussed. It certainly wasn't the intent, uh, and I think it could be interpreted as requiring it. And so I wanted to share. So we would support expanding um, that coverage and making it more clear. What I was able to find going into this morning's testimony is some helpful language from Colorado, and I'm happy to share uh, that that uh, version of prohibiting civil arrests in the courthouses. It was passed into law, I think, in 2020, in March. And there, they drop reference to person, household member, family member, as well as dropping reference to witnesses, jurors, and instead just say a person. A person shall not be subject to civil arrest while the person is present at a courthouse or on its environs or while going to, attending, or coming from a court proceeding. And so I'm happy to share this. We would, we would support uh, similar language going in. And I think that would address the concerns that have been raised on this point. Yeah, thank you. If you can share that with, um, with Eric, that'd be really helpful. Oh. Sure, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a, um, maybe this is something that Eric covered yesterday and I missed it, uh, but I'll just ask you as well. Um, so what restrictions are there on what the state can do vis-a-vis -a, -vis a federal agent exercising their authority to, mm -hmm. to I mean, what's the extent of what kind of punishments or prohibitions can, can we put on? Right. Uh, a federal a uh, agent in the, in the situation. I, and I heard those questions come up yesterday a little bit. What, what is the authority and what is the role? Uh, I think that, that it, again, Eric Fitzpatrick shared the uh, federal district court decision out of New York where a federal judge uh, considered that same question. And I'm familiar with that decision as well. And as he shared yesterday, uh, that judge and I would agree with the legal analysis that judge considered, again, the centuries old privilege and how that is, has existed uh, coming into the creation and, and, and establishment of our federal constitution. And therefore then reading that as consistent with our system of federalism and reserving to the states um, the ability to, to you know, set up their own state court systems and to make sure that, that those can be administered uh, properly, uh, that 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 was done in the same contemplation. So again, presumably that that is uh, permitted. That that the court's authority to prohibit all from from conducting a civil arrest would extend to federal agents as well, who are trying to do uh, a civil arrest under immigration law. I do want to share that that I think uh, Senate Judiciary did try to get someone from. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office to share their thoughts on this bill, but they and so then an invitation was extended, but declined as apparently they do um, so, as a matter of course. Yeah, just a, a follow. It, it's a I guess a little more nuanced. That it, uh, are there limitations as far as whether it's a criminal penalty or a civil penalty? You know that that I mean, are there limitations there? So I. I uh, I don't know the answer to that up front. What I do know is this bill doesn't doesn't talk about criminal punishments. It talks about uh, civil contempt proceedings and, of course, the the, the establishment of the, of the civil action, right, um, or liability. But in terms of what the court could do as a sanction against these federal agents, I understand it as specifically limiting it to uh, civil contempt proceedings under Chapter Five, Title Twelve. Now that could include imprisonment. It could include uh, fines, right? And and as you 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 were uh, teasing out yesterday, uh, the difference of what is criminal, what is civil, what 
what, what is punishment versus what is uh, effectively trying to compel action, right? Um, I think this is consistent with the purpose of civil contempt, which is to try to compel action to prevent, to, to compel compliance with the standing court order. You shall not arrest for uh, civil or conduct civil arrests. So, so on that, I, I mean, I think you know, Eric did look into the civil contempt a little bit more. I'm sure we're going to hear from him a little bit more. And, and I, I continue to think that that civil contempt doesn't work in this situation. So, uh, uh, criminal contempt could uh, work in this situation, uh, and that's where. But I, I guess criminal contempt is still a little bit different animal than being charged with a criminal offense. Mm -hmm. And so I, did, I mean, these are very nuanced things, but I'm, I am trying to, to, to tease those out to see what what's the best um, consequence of, of somebody breaking this, this offense or breaking this law. So I think what's, what's helpful here is we do have an old, old Vermont Supreme Court case law interpreting this privilege, again, because it's common law. And it was specifically addressing the question of remedies. And in that case, it's, it's for the record, it's in Ray Healy, uh, 53 VT 694, 1881. And I'm happy to share that decision later. Uh, but, but effectively, I think the Supreme Court uh, considered that question. You know, someone civilly arrested uh, because uh, for another civil action. And so they, they um, Supreme Court considered as a sanction uh, their ability to uh, imprison indefinitely or to uh, order a fine um, subject to uh, the person who was violating it, this conducting the civil arrest, dismissing the action. Right? When, the, when, when, that, when that civil arrest the, the civil action that was connected to the civil arrest basis, right? right. Uh, once that violator dropped the suit, they were allowed to, you know, not be in prison, to not to to, to return the fine, right. right? Paid. So again, that's not criminal because if it was, you wouldn't get your fine back. Even if you, if even if you dismiss the case, you would still have to serve the time in prison, right? right. So, so it is nuanced, but it is interesting the this sort of this how this court has treated how to enforce this privilege in the past. We have an example, and it was through the civil contempt proceedings. Yeah, and I guess with respect to that, it may that may get into some more um, difficult terrain when we're talking about requiring the dismissal of a federal detention, you know, I mean, immigration uh, issue uh, to to free the individual or uh, or to lift the fine. And, and I'm not sure where that necessarily goes. But. All right. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, if you could send us the case, that'd be, that'd be great. I'd like to be I, I will. I will. Yeah. Um, I don't have any other testimony. Uh, so. There are no other questions. Uh, actually, Bob, has I just yeah. have a question. Sure. So, as this bill is presented, should it pass? We've had rulings from Colorado and the state of New York. We have not had a ruling from the state of Vermont in reference to this particular bill. So, this bill, in your interpretation, would re simply be remanded to Vermont law enforcement because we've never had a ruling through our Vermont federal courts as to what what our federal agencies can do. So are we kind of putting a cart before the horse here and not filing for a ruling or something to the federal court system prior to, you know, passing this bill, should I say? You're looking for, you're looking for a challenge, obviously, in federal court. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> no, well, I, I certainly hope it doesn't get challenged, but if it does get challenged, I think that, that, that it is lawful. And so I don't think we need to wait for this question to be resolved by the courts, uh, A, because we do have uh, so much um, foundational understanding of where this privilege comes from, including our own Supreme Court, right? Not in this specific context. And then we do have it from um, most recently with the, with the New York Federal District Court, 
again, confirming where you can look at that analysis. So no, I don't think this is going out on a limb. Uh, I, I do think that this is uh, codifying what has long been the privilege. The question is, why do we need to do it? Unfortunately, as we heard from previous testimony, the need is, is being forced upon us because of ICE is making these arrests uh, and, and disrupting the state court proceedings. If this wasn't happening, then we probably wouldn't be here trying to do this um, because it hasn't had to be done before. Well, to some extent, I agree with you, but you started off by saying it's not really a problem in Vermont. We really haven't had a whole lot of examples in Vermont. And then, you know, so as far as the disruption within our core system, mm -hmm. I still can't believe that it's because uh, should this law pass, our, our federal entities are going to abide by it. And I don't, I don't think you think that's going to happen either. So. I'm sorry. And if you wanted to. Oh, no. I, well, I, 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 to the extent of how, how the federal um, agencies and the attorneys will respond to, to it. We'll just have to see. I, I don't know. I do know that uh, having read the case law to support it, there is there is no reason to question both the legal authority of this state legislature to, to pass this. And in terms of, of knowing what the problem and how small or big of a problem it is, here, it is admittedly our numbers of, of non-citizens is, is smaller, but it is impacting our, 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 our cases. And the unknown is the killing effect and how much is spread, right? And how, how um, how also the sort of the ripple effects beyond just showing up to the courtroom, but now extending to fearing trusting law enforcement to call them when 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 people need when these communities uh, need protection to even initiate these these proceedings in the first place. So um, I think it's an important message to send. I also think that uh, the impact um, will will be bigger than what the small numbers of non-citizens that we just look at um, will be. Yeah, and I, I, I'm trying to think of other times when we've done this, but whether it's Good Samaritan or, or we've done other, we've, I'm sorry, but I'm just not remembering all the, the bills that we passed, but recognizing that it is important for, for victims and, and others to be able to come forward and, and work with law enforcement and really achieve public safety for for all and get and community policing. I mean, there's a, like you said, there, there really are many more um, implications and reasons. Um, Lena. Yeah, I think you addressed it a little bit with um, Martin's question, but I'm, and we certainly got a, a really good and clear legal opinion from attorney Fitzpatrick yesterday, <laughs> but I just wanted to um, ask if on the record, you just kind of, uh, because I think it's good to have multiple legal opinions on the record, just address that question of the legislator, the legislature's authority to make a state law um, about this in the face of kind of federal immigration law. Yes, no, I, I think again, um, there's this fundamental principle of federalism and what has been reserved to the states, right? And, and I think because there's this question, federal enforcement of immigration laws, civil immigration laws, right, versus the state's clear authority to create a state court system and to administer that uh, system so that it can adjudicate and address the uh, the rights of its of its citizens of its of its residents in the state. And this privilege is at the heart of it, right? This privilege essentially puts that protection bubble around it to make sure people feel that they can access the courts, all people, right, who have any any interest. Um, and and I think that that is where uh, that is where the the authority is in terms of this interplay and seeming tension between what is federal of, uh, and what, whether the state is, is stepping on the toes potentially of encroaching upon federal law enforcement. Again, this bill doesn't try to prevent federal uh, ICE agents from enforcing immigration laws elsewhere. It is really truly just this 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 situation, this place, um, so that we can um, have no disruption or as little disruption uh, to our state court systems. Um. Um, yeah, yeah and, and just, this is really quite, and my main concern is I don't want to get this tripped up by putting in the wrong remedy or consequence. 
consequence. And that's why I'm just trying to tease that out to make sure. Uh, so I appreciate what your input was on that. Uh, yeah, and then my only response to you is, is we can also look at how well these other jurisdictions have done it, and specifically New York, where we have had the federal uh, uh, courts maybe review it more. Uh, and I believe those have also been um, said in the civil contempt proceeding context. But I, I, I'll, I'll double check. So that's my understanding. I appreciate it. Uh, Coach. Uh, thanks. Good to see you again. Um, I, I think that, you know, Martin's question really gets to, you know, part of the, the you know, the core, um, you know, question. Uh, and then, you know, that that relationship, um, you know, with, you know, the federal, uh, you know, officers, you know, is another question. But one of the tenets of our committee uh, that we all collectively uh, agreed upon was access to justice. You know, and, you know, when we think about, you know, that access, you know, that does mean that ability for, you know, all of our Vermonters at any point in time to be able to access you know, our judicial system. Uh, and, you know, that's where the courts, you know, I should say the higher courts, you know, the, uh, you know, the district and Supreme Courts uh, do battle, you know, over that federalism, you know, question. But at the end of the day, our first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that as many Vermonters, you know, who choose to access or need to access, you know, the judicial system can. And I hope that that's what the intention of this bill continues to be. Um, so I, I'm looking at the bill as introduced and I, I can't reconcile what you know the difference is as it passed, but um, but in coming to what passed the Senate, um, would you say that stakeholders work together, or um, we will hear from DOC and, and I um, do hope to hear from the sheriffs? Um, does this represent that, or or or, or no? Yes, no. My my understanding is that this represents um, everyone's uh, after everyone had a chance to to weigh in and share their, their, their thoughts. I think that there were very few changes, although um, I, I know that Erin Jacobson is gonna follow and so she can she can fill in um, more on that. I do know that there was an addition on line 20 for um, in the remedy section and making it clear that this doesn't, and, 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 and increasing the mens rea requirement. Uh, and that was a concern that we wouldn't inadvertently capture uh, actions where uh, law enforcement officers were were trying to to do their job and, and ensure um, you know public safety wasn't at issue and so again there was the insertion of knowingly or willfully I forget which one but it was an addition um, I think that was it but I'm sure Aaron Jacobson and Paul will add uh, more if I've missed something. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Great. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Dad. Good morning to the committee. Uh, so nice to be here in person. For the record, my name is Erin Jacobson from the Community Justice Division at the Attorney General's Office. Um, I'm here today to testify in strong support of S-140. I do want to begin with a couple of anecdotes from my direct personal experience from when, <clears throat> before my current position, I was an immigration attorney at the Vermont Law School. Um, the first experience I had with um, civil courthouse arrests by ICE was in um, 2013, I believe when actually a victim's advocacy organization in the Northeast Kingdom called me 
um, the, the advocate I spoke to on the phone was kind of in a panic. She was in a lot of distress. Um, and she said that uh, one of the people that they'd been working with had just been arrested at a courthouse in the Northeast <coughs> Kingdom. Um, and that she had been there simply to get a protection order. Um, that it had been kind of a fraught journey um, to even try to um, help ensure that, that the person they were trying to help felt like that she could contact the police. She was really, really reluctant to ever call the police about the abuse she'd been experiencing at the hands of her husband. Um, she had a small child. She'd overstayed a visa. She was afraid that she was going to be arrested. She had a real mistrust of police and government in general. And um, the law enforcement in that community then did help her find safety. But it was when she went to court to um, explain why she needed a protection order um, where she was arrested by ICE and detained. Um, and so it was the, ad, the victim's advocacy organization that managed to get her out of detention and then called me to help her with her immigration situation. Um, but again, this was, so this was in 2013. The second time I experienced um, a courthouse arrest of a client was in 2017 um, when um, one of my clients went to the Windsor County Courthouse to um, respond to um, a negligent operation of a motor vehicle charge where she pled guilty. She admitted that she had in fact done that and that she and then her public defender left the courthouse and it was when she was at the clerk's office paying a fine that two plainclothes officers came and arrested her, um, didn't tell her why or what was happening, put her in an unmarked car. Um, luckily, she, a friend had been accompanying her to the proceedings, and it was her friend who called me saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. I don't know who took her. I don't know where they're taking her. I'm following them on the highway right now. And also, I can't get in touch with her lawyer because her lawyer had already left the courthouse. Um, turns out she'd been arrested by ICE. She was detained in St. Albans for several hours. She was only able to um, get out of that detention because she had a small child at home that she needed, and she was the sole care provider. Um, and so um, luckily, the ICE officers in St. Albans um, let her go on her own recognizance, but she was then put into removal proceedings. So she, currently now um, she is um, in those removal proceedings. She very well could be deported. Um, that again, that was in 2017. So shortly thereafter, um, Chief Justice Reiber actually um, wrote a memo um, to the judiciary and talked about how um, in that memo, how fair and free access to our state courts is enshrined in the Vermont Constitution. Um, and that when that access is foreclosed by fear of civil arrest, then we are all less secure. And at that time, the ju judiciary's response was to try to, with other chief justices around the United States, um, to try to work with ICE on coming up with some kind of a compromise to protect the sanctity of our courthouses um, that the judiciaries recognized um, was really inhibiting um, access to justice and just the government wheels from, from continuing to turn. ICE did not want to work with the courts. Um, and so that's another reason why codifying this common law protection is an important step for states to take. Um, there are some really good important questions about, well, what happens if we have this state law and then somebody is arrested at a courthouse and then, and then this turns, there's federal litigation. Well, that's going to be, that, that will, honestly, that's going, to, that's going to bring up tricky legal questions about federalism, about the supremacy clause. Um, but it also brings up the 10th Amendment and the protections that states have 
to make sure that we can effectuate our sovereign interests. And one of those most important sovereign interests is making sure that our courts are, are running smoothly, that people do not fear showing up to pay fines or to get a protection order. Um, and that this, this kind of state codification of the um, old common law protection um, that allows people to go into state courts without fear um, then bolsters the state's argument for how important our, we feel our sovereign interest is. Um, and so that would only serve to strengthen the state's case um, should, the, should the federal government try to argue that somehow um, the supremacy clause trumps our, our, sub, our sovereign interests. Um, I would say too though, that in terms of supremacy clause arguments that the federal government might try to make, um, if the supremacy clause only really establishes that federal law wins when there's a conflict between like the federal law and the state law. And what this bill, S-140, would do is simply say, we, are, we need to protect the sanctity of our courts, of our system of government, that we, that we and our Vermont Constitution have principles about access to justice. And therefore, we feel that we need to make sure that we protect that. We're not, this bill does not say, hey, ICE, you can't do your job ever. You can't, you, uh, Department of Homeland Security, you can no longer regulate immigration. This does not say that. This bill simply says, that if you are going to effectuate an immigration arrest um, and you need, you feel that you need to do it at a courthouse, then get a warrant. Also, this bill says nothing about criminal arrests. So this is really just saying that immigration enforcement or anybody else can't come into our courthouses and effectuate a civil arrest. Doesn't mean that immigration enforcement can't do their jobs. Um, so just to, one last thread, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. After Justice Reiber and the other um, chief justices, several other chief justices around the country tried to come up with a compromise with ICE, and, and then that didn't work, that was, that was in, I believe that was in 20, late 2017. As Beto very effectively testified, he was then arrested in 2018. So, you know, Nothing, there, there was no efficacy in trying to negotiate and, the, and yet, and Vermont didn't have any <coughs> state law um, that Vermonters could then find protection through or that the judiciary could point to and say, look, we have these protections in state law. You cannot effectuate these arrests here. Um, the other last thing I wanna point out, sorry, I know, already said I was gonna point out one more thing is that the first story I told about the woman who was um, just trying to get a protection order, that was in 2013. So that was the Obama administration. At that time, the Obama administration had a very similar policy to what the Biden administration has now, which you would think, I mean, the way it was stated was that we, um, you would, the presumption is you're not going to make courthouse arrests unless the public safety interests far outweigh the interests that states have in, in making sure that they have access to justice. Well, it happened anyway. My client, the only law she had broken was she had overstayed a visa and she was just at the courthouse to get a, a protection order. So in no way was her arrest something to do with public safety. So my point is just that it's not just a Trump administration issue. This can happen anytime, and it does happen, and it can be despite um, policy memos that the, the, the current administration might have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, and I appreciate your appreciate um, that and, and your testimony. And I and I actually before you said it, I had a, a note. Look at Vermont Constitution access to justice language, and I and I know that Justice Driver speaks about that a lot when he comes here. Um, and so if you can have a copy of his, his letter you know, that, you, that you read, it would be really helpful. I'll try to find it, Chair Grad, where uh, I only knew about it um, from the judiciary back in 2017. And then the only thing I could dig up recently was when he 
um, an old VPR interview with Justice Reiber about the memo itself and um, in which he's quoted, in which the memo is quoted and also the discussion about they're trying to compromise with ICE. But I'll, I'll dig harder and see if I can find it. And the VPR link would be, would be very helpful. Sure. Happy to provide that. Yeah. Uh, Martin. Yeah. So do you know if the courts uh, in these situations have considered uh, issuing <laughs> uh, criminal contempt citations against the uh, ICE officials who are disturbing the court proceedings? I do not know it, whether they have. I do know that that has not come up as an issue in litigation. Um, and so I think it's an open question. Your questions are really good ones about the power of courts to um, effectuate you know, criminal contempt or civil contempt orders. I would say that I think what that's that well that that contempt remedy is in Colorado's bill uh, and New York's also um, and I from my read not knowing a lot about um, contempt powers and maybe Judge Zone would be a good witness on that um, is that it's trying to allow for the court to have its own remedy. In other words, if the court doesn't have a remedy, if the judge sitting there can't um, stop an arrest from happening, then the only other remedy is to wait for like the attorney general's office to file an, for an injunction in court or for the individual who was arrested to try to um, try to effectuate their own remedy. So I, that's my understanding of like the purpose of it is to try to give an immediate remedy to the court itself, because that's also underlying the purpose of the bill. Um, it, but I don't know the answer to your question about powers of courts to be able to do that, um, to issue contempt orders to, to federal agents. Yeah, I guess the other question I'd, I'd have is, is, and this is for any Eric or uh, Rebecca, I mean, is there any place else where we've had as a remedy in statute uh, civil or criminal contempt? Maybe there is, but that seems to be very much a court-centered remedy that, I mean, courts issue. It's not, you don't generally have law enforcement involved. I know that you can have a defender involved if somebody is being held in criminal contempt. They have the right to have uh, defense. But that seems to be very much a court center. I mean, like a need, court rule versus a statutory remedy. Yeah, I just don't, I mean, are there other places where we've actually, in statute, have said, yes, we have. Title 15, right? I mean, in family. Yes. Is there okay? I, I, okay, okay, good. Oh, so I won one. Okay. <laughs> well, there, there we go. Should I ask the chair? Right? <laughs> so with, with then, um, oh my gosh, Judge, now Judge Devine was working for. Um, okay, well, that answers that question. But, Okay. So, okay. I can find it. Sure. Yeah. Well, and and, and um, Title 12, Chapter 5, as it lays out the civil contempt proceedings and what the court can or can't do. And, yes. and the annotations there will be helpful in terms of where the cross references are to that. It's right. Thank you very much. It's right here, right here in the bill, it in fact says that. So, sorry about the question. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. And now we have um, Joshua um, Rutherford from DOC. Thank you so much for being here on, on such short notice. I'm sorry that the invitation didn't come sooner. No, no problem. And just glad for the opportunity to offer testimony on this bill for the department. Okay. Thank you. Um, for the record, uh, Joshua Rutherford, Director of Classification with the Vermont Department of Corrections. Uh, we did provide testimony on this bill to the Senate. Um, our only concern was that uh, our staff are sometimes in the courthouses, um, whether for other business or uh, with somebody in custody. Uh, and we did not want our staff to accidentally or unknowingly um, be involved in something that would put them at liability because they were attempting to help a law enforcement officer resolve something or they had custody of a person who um, somebody was attempting to serve a civil arrest on. So the Senate added that knowing and willfully language um, that addresses our concern uh, and DOC has, has no objection to this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's incredibly helpful. Uh, okay. 
Bob, do you want to have questions or pursue this? <laughs> I was, and I don't know who to ask this to. And, it, and it's, a, it's a touchy issue, obviously. It, it appears as though, just in my opinion, this, this is a bit of a ruse here. Because what I'm looking for and what I'm hearing from our witnesses is that, uh, well, this, I'm sorry, Roberto or, or whatever, uh, can you give me an example of, of, of any, anybody, anyone else who's been arrested on a civil warrant that wasn't in violation of a federal law, so to speak, without, without going there? It appears as though we're, we're talking immigration issues here and not really, I, I don't know how to use the term Vermonters, but I mean, what, what's going on with this bill here? I mean. So I'll, I'll address that. I'll first ask um, DOC Joshua if you, if you can respond to that. Um, if not, um, then I'll turn to the other. Yeah, I, I think that's a little out outside my wheelhouse. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I do see hands. Sure, should I show my phone? Um, you just sit here. Yeah, but uh, I, I, identify yourself for, uh, sure, for the record. Sure, Turner, yeah. uh, Defender General's Office. Uh, I think I think your question is, is is fair. Like, where else do we see civil arrests happening, right? And and I was I heard your question yesterday, and I did I did some review of where civil arrests are authorized in this state, and um, there's a civil rule. Vermont Civil Rule 4.3, uh, where they have generally prohibited civil arrest before final judgment, before final judgment. Um, and again, when I cited and talked about that old 1881 case from Vermont Supreme <coughs> Court reviewing this privilege, it was in the context of a civil arrest that has now been prohibited by this Vermont Supreme Court rule. And that's for policy reasons, because you know, they don't, they don't want to, um, there are other ways to deal with this. But what has been <clears> named <throat> is that there are still now uh, fewer uh, avenues for civil arrest to still occur uh, post judgment to enforce a court order <clears throat> in a civil case, right? Uh, where damages are, are awarded and, and there is failure to pay, right? There's, there's those, there's big cases there, um, as, and as well as. You know, where a court, where a subpoena has been issued for a witness to show up in an action and just won't show up. Uh, there can be a civil arrest if that person is at the courthouse because there has been a subpoena issued. Those those exceptions are actually in the bill uh, and they're reflected there on uh, lines 13 through, through uh, 16. So it, it is it is great to see that integration of, of where our law is on this state. But you're right, your instinct is right. The civil arrests pre judgment are not happening. Uh, and, and I understand the motivation for this bill is because of what we are seeing around the country and here in Vermont is an uptick of how civil arrests are arising in our state courthouses, and that's the federal immigration agents uh, coming in to do civil arrests. Thank you. Yeah. Or not, or anything or anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, will you just tell us what the what the rule? Yes, it's again four point uh, three. Civil civil procedure mm -hmm. four point three. Four point three. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have it up here. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Any uh, before we adjourn? Can I just? Add, yeah. I did forget one thing. Aaron Jacobson. Attorney General's Office for the record, we would also um, be in very strong support of expanding the protections to all people who are appearing at state courthouses or going to or leaving from. Um, and the suggested language by the Defender General's Office from the Colorado bill, um, we, we support as well. Yep. So I, just to follow up to the earlier question that I had about contempt. Um, and so just just reading the, the chapter five uh, and, and also looking at what we have in here, I, chapter five is, is giving certainly the authority to courts uh, to issue contempt orders uh, if, a, if an order or decree is violated, but it's very much in the language of discretion to the court. Whereas in this bill, if we go this direction, whether it's civil or criminal contempt, 
we are saying that it shall be subject to, to contempt. And that's a little bit different. And I'm wondering, again, in the family law situation, I, you know, if, if, there's, if there's any places where we're actually saying this will be the outcome, as a, which is taking that away from the court's discretion. And, and that's really how I see the contempt. It's really a discretionary action of the court. So with whatever way we go, I think we uh, that shell uh, language may be problematic. Okay. Well, Eric can look into that. Great. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, and we will um, we set the charts and make sure that they testify um, as they did in the Senate. 